Okay, so I think we can get started. So uh, thanks for everyone for joining this academic training lecture series on dark matter searches. It's uh, really a great pleasure for me to introduce Dan Tovey, who's a professor of uh, experimental physics at the University of Sheffield, and who will be giving this three lecture series on dark matter searches. So Dan started his research career doing his PhD on direct detection dark matter searches. And then following his PhD, he moved uh, to more collider-based uh, experimental physics uh, and has been working in the ATLAS collaboration at the LHC, where he has been the supersymmetry working group convener for a number of years at the beginning um, of ATLAS. And more recently, he's been the physics coordinator for the full physics program of ATLAS. So he's extremely well-placed uh, to talk about dark matter searches. And in fact, recently he started, uh, to, he's joined the Lux Zeppelin collaboration, which is again, a direct detection dark matter experiment. So he's uh, yeah, got a very good range of experiences to uh, tell us about direct and uh, indirect searches for dark matter at colliders. So I think that's all I'll say and I'll pass over to Dan. So please go ahead and thanks very much for doing these lectures. Okay, thanks, Jamie. Um, uh, so thanks to you and to Albert and, and others for inviting me to, to give these um, these talks. It's, it's been a very uh, interesting process uh, preparing, preparing the, uh, the slides. So I've, I've learned quite a bit more about, uh, about the subject than I, than I knew previously. Um, certainly, um, it's been a very fast moving topic over the past uh, few years. So um, there's a lot of new developments, which hopefully I can uh, introduce you, you all to. Um, I should say, first of all, though, that um, uh, dark matter searches are a very, very broad topic. Uh, so as, as Jamie has already alluded to, this covers um, uh, both traditional accelerator and collider-based particle physics. It covers uh, what's loosely called astroparticle physics. So that is um, uh, particle physics conducted either using astrophysical signals or using particles created in astrophysical sources. And also it encompasses astrophysics in the sense that uh, we have indirect dark matter searches. So it's a huge topic. Um, in three hours or so, I'm, I'm not going to be able to cover anything in, in great vast detail. So uh, I apologize if I uh, don't um, cover your favorite topic in the, in the level of detail that you might, uh, like, might like to see. Um, it will be a, a fairly high level uh, overview of the subject. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of assuming I'm talking to a broad range of, uh, of, of um, people who some of you may well be expert in, in one or more of these areas. Others uh, may be, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, um, beginners in the area or, or even just uh, listening out of interest um, from the, the, the wider CERN physics program. Um, so I, I hope you'll all be able to take something away from this. Um, as I said, I won't be going to anything in, in vast technical detail, um, but hopefully you'll get some kind of overview uh, flavor of what's, um, what's going on. Um, so um, the other thing I should say is that uh, if you are interested in, in getting more information, um, I've put references on most of the pages. Um, so you can go away and get more information there. Um, in terms of recent uh, re reviews of the subject, um, again, being very broad, a very, very broad subject, it's, uh, it's difficult to find one, one single document which covers everything. But I think um, uh, particularly on the, the, the um, direct detection, um, then a, a good place to start actually is a recent uh, report from the APEC committee, um, the European Astroparticle Physics um, Committee, which I have the references to that uh, at the end of, uh, I think at the end of um, the second lecture, actually. Um, there's also on the Collider side, there's the LHC Dark Matter Working Group, which has uh, a lot of resources on, on their uh, website. So I have some links to that as well. Um, and in fact, uh, as is always the case in our field, um, if you go and look at the Particle Data Group pages, you'll see some excellent reviews uh, on uh, several reviews covering topics uh, within the remit of this, this lecture series. So both direct dark matter searches, cosmology, uh, axion searches, and, and uh, the whole range. 
Um, so so I'd, I'd urge you to go and look at those references if, you, if you'd like more information. Um, the other thing I should say is that the, uh, given the time constraints, I, I've been largely, not exclusively, but largely pretty um, strict in terms of what I consider dark matter searches. So um, I'll be talking about um, indirect um, astrophysical searches, direct astroparticle searches and collider searches. Um, largely, I won't be talking about hidden sector, uh, more general hidden sector searches. I'll touch on that in a few places, but um, I won't be going into a lot of detail. Dan, on that. Dan are, are you actually moving your slides forward already or not? I, I'm not, I'm not yet. No, no. Oh, okay, then we're good. No, I'm, ju I'm just giving a sort of <laughs> overview. Um, so, yeah, so, um, uh, so I, I will be, I will touch on hidden sector searches, but not, uh, that won't be the main topic of the, of the talk. Okay, so without further ado, um, I'll just move on to the um, uh, right, let's, next slide. So this is a lecture plan. So lecture one, um, I'll be covering the basic motivations for dark matter searches. Um, so a little bit of cosmology. This is not my main area of expertise. So if you have detailed technical questions, uh, please, uh, uh, I, I urge you to look at the references if, if I can't answer them for you. Um, a bit about the astrophysics of, of, uh, of dark matter and how that relates to dark matter searches. Uh, one particular very popular uh, class of, of dark matter candidate, which is the, the WIMP or weakly interacting massive particle. Uh, and then I'll round off today talking about indirect uh, astrophysical uh, WIMP searches uh, of various uh, types. Tomorrow I'll be devoting the full hour to looking at um, direct searches for uh, WIMPs, astroparticle searches for WIMPs, um, uh, both the strategy and also the technologies that are used there. So I'll go into perhaps a bit more detail there. Uh, and then lecture three, um, I'll be covering then uh, collider uh, WIMP and dark matter searches uh, and then searches for lighter dark matter, and in particular, axions and ALPs. Um, so I hope that that will cover a broad spectrum of candidates. Um, roughly speaking, uh, the way I've order ordered this is that we'll start with the heaviest candidates and then move down through to the lightest. Um, and so hopefully we'll cover the, the full range. So I'll start out with, with the sort of motivation for dark matter searches. So this this really comes from, um, from cosmology and, and uh, astrophysics. And um, so really the, um, you know, the, this, 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 these lectures are an overview of efforts to identify the nature of, of particle dark matter. So we have good, good reason to believe, as I'll come on to, that um, dark matter is in the form, exists and is in the form of particles. Uh, and so we really want to understand the nature of that dark matter through direct or indirect observation with non-gravitational interactions. So gravitational interactions of dark matter are already well established. Um, and so we want to see something else happening with the dark matter particles. Um, as I said earlier, it's a huge topic, massive growth, um, and, and in particular diversification of candidates over the past 10 years. So really, um, if you look at this subject, maybe 10, 20 years ago, it was really focused exclusively on, on, um, on WIMPs um, and electroweak scale dark matter candidates. So there's really been a huge explosion in, in um, interesting candidates over the past few years. Um, I'm gonna focus on experimental searches primarily uh, with a bit of the related theory, but not a lot. It's not my main area of expertise. Um, and I'm not really going to take a historical approach to this. So although I will initially talk a little bit about the um, the history behind this field, uh, that won't be my main uh, motivation. As I said, I can't possibly hope to cover all uh, candidates or experimental techniques. So first of all, what's the cosmological evidence for dark matter? Well, I think, I think it's pretty clear now that the, we have what, what's sort of called a concordance model or a, you know, precision cosmology is, is the phrase that's sometimes used, which has developed over the past 60 years and in particular with the um, very rapid development of um, cosmology uh, based on observations of the cosmic microwave background and, and also other cosmological probes like baryon acoustic oscillations other, other, and other probes. 
uh, we have a really very good understanding of, uh, on a cosmological distance scales, of, of, of what constitutes the universe. And from that, we can establish that, um, uh, that 26 percent of the mass energy density of the universe is in the form of, of cold, dark matter. Uh, we have about 5 percent in the form of baryonic matter and something like just under 70 percent is in the form of dark energy. Uh, now, dark energy is, is of course, a, a completely different topic. It, it exists at a completely different energy scale to dark matter, has very different properties. So I won't be touching on that at all in this, in this, uh, this lecture series. But of course, that's 70% of the, of the universe. <laughs> so that's also a very important topic. Uh, cold dark matter, a bit, of, a bit about terminology. Cold dark matter is non-relativistic at, at, at the uh, epoch of decoupling, um, which I'll come on to in a little bit. Uh, and so this typically means that the particles are relatively heavy and um, the structure that they form in the universe, they, they, they um, seed the growth of large scale structure in the universe, structure grows from small to large scales. And this is by contrast with hot dark matter, uh, which uh, for instance might be in the form of um, uh, light standard model uh, neutrinos, uh, where, in which case, the, the structure grows from large to small scales. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence that, um, cosmological evidence, that in fact the, the bulk of the dark matter is in the form of cold, uh, cold dark matter. So, um, uh, just a, a word about why we think that this dark matter is, is in the form of new particles. Um, you might ask, well, could this not just be dark baryonic matter of the, of the kind that we, we see around us um, all the time? Uh, and the difficulty with that is that we have an excellent uh, theory uh, for which explains the abundance of the light elements in the, uh, in the early universe. So these, these light elements, uh, so lithium, uh, helium and deuterium uh, are created in the early universe and uh, the theory of Big Bang nuclear synthesis um, really gives uh, a, a very good agreement uh, with astrophysical measurements of the abundances and relative abundances of these, uh, these observations. There's a small discrepancy uh, with uh, the abundance of, of lithium-7. So this is the right-hand figure you can see here. Um, so the yellow boxes show the, um, the uh, observations. Uh, the curves are the predictions from Big Bang nuclear synthesis. And um, there's sort of a, a, a pretty good concordance also with the CMB constraints uh, on these, um, on the, what, the baryon to photon ratio in the universe. Um, as I said, there is a, um, a, a discrepancy with the lithium seven, that's the, the bottom curve. You see the yellow box is off to the left. Uh, and, but um, that's something which is, I believe has more um, astrophysical uncertainties associated with the systematics. So um, there's, you have to take that with a bit, bit more of a pinch of salt. Um, anyway, there is, there is pretty good agreement there. Uh, there is a sort of concordance model of, 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 this, uh, of this, these abundances. And this indicates that the majority of the matter uh, in the universe must be, must be non-baryonic uh, uh, dark matter. So in other words, this gives you very strong constraints on the amount of baryonic matter in the universe. Uh, and since we see a lot more of that, a uh, lot more matter in the universe from, from um, cosmological observations, that tells you the majority must be non-baryonic. So how do we go about producing dark matter in the universe? Well, many dark matter models rely upon what's called thermal production. So this is a very simple process. You have a, a very hot plasma, incredibly hot plasma in the early universe. And in that plasma, it's, it's because of its temperature and its energy density, you are uh, pair producing and annihilating uh, all the particles that are uh, kinematically accessible uh, for that uh, energy density. And then as the universe expands, it, it cools and the, the temperature and energy density decreases after the Big Bang. And at some point, the um, density falls below the point at which um, the uh, particles which are being created can then meet each other and, and, and annihilate. Um, so having created heavy particles in that plasma, uh, then they, they no longer meet each other to annihilate. And so they, they remain around, uh, 
around us. And this is called freeze out. And so the, effectively the dark matter falls out of thermal equilibrium with this plasma, which carries on cooling. Uh, so it um, falls out of equilibrium with the heat bath. And the, at that point, the dark matter abundance remains fixed. Now, that dark matter abundance is then going to be strongly related to the uh, annihilation cross-section for, uh, for the dark matter particles. The, the larger the annihilation cross-section, the more uh, likely it is that, uh, that you will remove dark matter particles, um, and so the dark matter density will be lower. So the freeze at what's called the freeze out temperature, which is the point at which this non-equilibrium uh, state uh, is created, and also the dark matter density rely uh, on this uh, what's called the thermally averaged uh, annihilation rate. So this is, you'll see this repeatedly through these talks. It's, it's the out thermal average of the cross section times the velocity uh, of the particles, so sigma v. And this is a quantity which is also related, can be related to what is measured in indirect dark matter searches. So, um, so th this is, there's a strong relationship there, uh, which we'll see later. There are other non-thermal models um, for dark matter um, production, for instance, involving the decay of heavy particles or uh, topological defects in the early universe, the cosmic strings, for instance. Um, I, I won't say much about that, but um, it, just to say that, as always, there are uh, multiple models available to you on the market. So this is, I'm only talking, when I talk about thermal production, that's not the only thing in town. So in terms of astrophysical uh, evidence, um, there's a long history of this. The earliest real evidence for dark matter came from applying the, uh, the virial theorem to um, uh, a cluster of galaxies, galaxies the Coma cluster. Uh, basically, this enables you to establish the, the mass of that cluster. And it was found to be inconsistent with the luminosity if you assume basically you, the usual uh, mass to luminosity ratio for, um, uh, for uh, visible baryonic matter. There was earlier work from, from um, these other authors as well, but this is sort of traditionally taken as the sort of the first, the start of, of dark matter studies from, from Swicky. Um, more recently, um, re I think perhaps one of the, 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 certainly the most commonly known evidence in the, with the general, uh, general public uh, comes from um, gravitational lensing. Um, and um, so we can look at dark matter in clusters from um, the gravitational lensing of light from background objects, for instance, quasars in the early universe. And that enables you to map the mass density in, um, in clusters. And the, the sort of the, the poster child for this, this technique is the bullet cluster, which you can see on the right. Uh, which uh, where gravitational lensing uh, provides um, very good evidence um, for uh, basically a strong distribution of, of mass uh, in between two separating um, regions of baryonic matter. So the red color that you see on this, this uh, picture here is, is, I guess, sort of inferred um, uh, location of, of this uh, additional uh, additional matter. So this gives some evidence for um, or dynamical evidence for invisible matter on on the scale of galaxy clusters. Um, then moving to smaller scales in galaxies, um, and this is really a crucial question for our efforts to uh, detect uh, dark matter. Um, directly or indirectly, is whether dark matter then is existing on smaller scales in, in galaxies. Because obviously we ourselves sit inside a galaxy, and so if, we, if we're going to conduct experiments locally, then we, we need to know that there is going to be dark matter present to, to detect. Um, so the original evidence there comes from um, galactic rotation curves, as they're called. So this is from Rubin and collaborators uh, in the 70s and 80s. And this is the classic evidence for dark matter that I guess if everyone, if anyone's ever sat through a, a dark matter uh, course at university, for instance, you know, it's the, it's the first thing that you, you look at is galactic rotation curves. And the basic idea is that the visible baryonic matter in a, dark, in, in a uh, spiral galaxy is concentrated in the core of the galaxy. So to a reasonable approximation, you can assume that that's where all the mass sits. 
And then you can look at the speed of rotation of um, visible matter, so that's stars, gas, etc., in the arms of the, of the galaxy. And if all the matter's concentrated in the center, then the velocity should fall off just from not simple Newtonian mechanics, like one over the square root of the radius. But what we actually observe using the Doppler effect to measure the rotation velocity is that the velocity is either constant or even increasing as you go to larger radii. And if you do a little bit of very simple uh, mechanics, then to get a, a constant velocity, then if you had a spherical population of additional matter in the galaxy, which we call the dark matter halo, um, then that would have a density profile where uh, rho is a function of radius, which goes like one over r squared. So it's not just uh, effectively a delta function comes concentrated at the, the core, it's, it's a, a spherical distribution of, of mass. Now, from many years of, of extensive observations of many different galaxies, uh, we know that the situation is a bit more complicated than that. And um, I guess the, 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 the um, density profiles that um, are on the market, there's many of them, but the sort of the two leading candidates that people look at are, one is uh, the Navarro, Frank and White profile, which you can see on the right here. And there's also one called the Inasto profile, which is sort of power law profile. Um, but in any case, these all give you a, a distribution of dark matter, which is extending well outside the galactic core. Um, just to say a word about dwarf galaxies. Um, so these are satellite galaxies which orbit around larger, larger galaxies, including our own. Um, and these are actually very, can provide very good laboratories for studying uh, uh, dark matter. Um, and provide some of the evidence actually for dark matter as opposed to other, um, other possible explanations for things like rotation curves in the form of modified gravity. Um, so the advantage of these, these objects is that certainly the ones that are orbiting our own galaxy are, are close by, so we can study them uh, accurately. Uh, there are some which have very high dark matter densities relative to um, baryonic matter. Um, which make them a prime target for indirect searches where we're looking for messenger signals like gamma rays or x-rays. Um, so they, because they really have so much dark matter in them relative to anything else. So if you see a signal, then that means there's less of a chance that it could be faked by, by some other um, astrophysics or, or effectively spectroscopy, atomic physics in, going on in the, in the baryonic matter. Um, there's also very low dark matter density uh, uh, dwarf galaxies, um, which, you know, if you, if you have a, a broad spectrum of galaxies with different amounts of dark matter in, then that is a challenge for um, uh, modified gravity theories such as MOND uh, um, to, to explain. Now, that's not to say that there are not uh, ways of, of doing this, but it, these provide very good laboratories for really trying to understand what's going on uh, with this behavior which we, uh, which we commonly uh, attribute to the existence of dark matter. And I should say that there is, um, in terms of particularly cold dark matter, there is um, a, something called the, the missing satellites problem, which is related to this, which is basically saying that when we conduct many body, end body simulations of um, uh, uh, structure formation in the universe, um, with cold dark matter present, then we expect many more of these uh, satellite galaxies around a typical galaxy than, than we actually observe to the Milky Way. So Milky Way, we observe something like 11 and we expect something like 500. Um, so this could indicate that cold dark matter is, is incorrect, um, but at the same time, um, it could be just that these missing galaxies are, are too dim to be observed. So it could be an acceptance times efficiency problem in the, in the language of particle physics. Um, so this is, this is something which is still an active topic of uh, investigation, but it could, it could mean that in fact, the traditional cold dark matter models are, are wrong. And it could be that you need uh, mixed dark matter or, or uh, warm dark matter or, or light, with lighter particles or something. But anyway, that's an open area of, of investigation. So then just to touch on, on a bit more about uh, dark matter in galaxies. Um, so if the dark matter is in a, is in a halo um, around uh, in, in which the visible matter is embedded, um, then this 
we have to, if we want to understand the existence of dark matter, then uh, we need to understand the behavior of the particles in that halo. So they're trapped in the potential well of the galaxy. And uh, if we are performing direct searches, which typically means terrestrial detectors looking for the direct interaction of dark matter particles, then obviously those particles are trapped in the, in the potential well of our own galaxy. Uh, if we conduct indirect searches, we're typically looking for annihilation or decay products of, of dark matter particles, either in our own galaxy or in other galaxies. Um, and so again, they're trapped in, in a potential well. So we need to understand the density and kinematics of the particles in order to conduct those searches. The usual assumption is that the dark matter particles ha have thermalized in the galactic potential well. So effectively, they become a collisionless Boltzmann gas uh, in, in the potential well of the, of the galaxy. And this is what's typically called the iso isothermal sphere model. But I should say there are other models on the market. Uh, this is just one, um, but it's a, it's a, it's a common uh, assumption which is used in many uh, direct and indirect dark matter searches. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the table here, you can see a few of the parameters of, the, uh, of, of this um, uh, Maxwellian velocity distribution for dark matter particles, which are often assumed in, in the searches. Uh, and one thing I'll, I'll note is that I mean, a key parameter is the velocity dispersion, V0, that's two, roughly 220 kilometers per second. Uh, we have the dark matter density, which is at our location, roughly 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter. So that's, as the cartoon at the bottom says, that's one squirrel in squirrel's worth of dark matter in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the Earth. Um, and we also need to take into account the fact that the Earth is, is orbiting the Sun, while well, the Earth is, is rotating on its axis, the Earth is orbiting around the Sun, and the Sun itself is orb orbiting around the, uh, around the galaxy. And all these differential motions are relevant for, um, particularly for direct dark matter searches, um, because those give additional signatures which we can use to, to identify a dark matter signal against various backgrounds. So I'll come on to that in lecture two. So how do we go about searching for dark matter? Well, there are three main ways, broadly speaking, uh, and they all have their advantages and disadvantages. So the first is the indirect searches. Uh, so here we look for annihilation or decay products of dark matter particles, which are trapped in uh, potential wells somewhere. So since dark matter um, is believed to be weakly interacting with baryonic matter, otherwise it wouldn't be dark, um, these particles can be trapped really in any, any uh, potential well, uh, astro astrophysical potential well. Um, and although that includes galaxies, that also includes the, the sun or even in, in planets like our own. Um, and when they're trapped there, then they can annihilate with each other. Uh, if we have um, uh, um, dark matter particles with a, a, a non-zero annihilation cross-section to produce uh, messenger signals such as X-rays, gamma rays, neutrinos, antimatter, etc. cetera. Um, now, um, this might be strong evidence for the existence of dark matter, but it wouldn't conclusively identify the the nature of the particle that we're looking at. That, that, that wouldn't provide us with the, the strongest information about that nature. Uh, direct searches then uh, use terrestrial detectors looking for the direct interaction of dark matter particles passing through the earth, through the detector, interacting. Um, and the, it, obviously it depends on the dark matter candidate what, what they interact with, um, but that could include nucleons uh, inside atomic nuclei, nuclei themselves, electrons uh, interacting with photons, for instance, from a magnetic field. Um, so again, those are good ways of um, giving strong evidence for the existence of, of the invisible particles in our local neighborhood, um, but it might not identify the particle. It might do they, if, you, if you see what, what, uh, what it's interacting with, but it, it, it may not give you conclusive evidence there. Uh, the third approach is accelerator or collider searches. Um, here, you seek evidence for the production of invisible particles in, in standard model particle collisions. And of course, there, 
you have the advantage that you may be able to see other stuff going on in the collisions alongside the dark matter production, which might give you a strong hint as to what sort of physics, uh, beyond the standard model physics, is, is taking place um, to give rise to the dark matter. But of course, in those experiments, you cannot prove that what you're seeing is dark matter. Uh, you know, the time taken, speed of light for a particle to escape from a, even a very large collider experiment like ATLAS or CMS is considerably less than the age of the universe. So, um, so you, you, although you have strong, very strong, uh, very circumstantial evidence for, uh, for the production of dark matter, you cannot prove that you've actually seen dark matter. Okay, so what uh, candidates uh, might we be looking at? So there's a huge, huge range of, of non-baryonic dark matter candidates. Um, part of the motivation for this, of course, is that this is one of the very few pieces of direct evidence for beyond the standard model physics that we have uh, at the moment. So um, really almost every BSM theory that's been proposed over the past 50 years in, includes a, a one or more dark matter candidates. So um, there's a huge range, and I, obviously in these talks, I will only be considering some very generic classes and, and only a few of those of that. Um, and I'm, I should note that everything I'm, we're assuming here is the dark matter must be weakly coupled to the standard model. If it was strongly interacting, then we might expect to see um, heavy elements, um, for instance, uh, in, uh, on, on Earth, um, the primor pr created primordially, uh, and we have conducted searches for uh, such anomalous heavy elements, we don't see them. So um, that's strong uh, evidence that we are looking at weakly coupled particles. And of course, it must be weakly coupled to light because otherwise it wouldn't be, wouldn't be dark. So uh, yeah, so there's a huge range of candidates here. Um, I won't be covering all the uh, candidates in this cartoon, um, like electrons painted with space camouflage, but um, I'll be covering some of them. So we'll start with weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. Um, so um, this, is, this is taken from the APEC community report. It's a nice summary of the field. And um, I, here we're looking at the upper, upper end of the mass range. Um, in the report, this is taken to somewhat lower masses, down to electron volt masses. Um, that is certainly a, a achievable in, in, in some models, but I think largely speaking in the most, gen most sort of commonly studied models, um, this is typically looking at masses of ME, order MeV and, and larger. So the motivation for, for WIMPs, weakly interactive massive particles, is, is, comes from what's called the WIMP miracle which is the observation that uh, if you calculate uh, the generic relic density for a, a dark matter particle, which can annihilate with itself, um, then you see that that is proportional to one over the thermally averaged annihilation cross-section. And you can then relate that generically to the mass and coupling of that particle. So if you want, want a, a relic density of order 30% of the mass energy density of the universe, and you choose a, relic, a, a dimensionless coupling of order one, then that gives you a mass uh, that is a, of order the electroweak scale. So this is this is sort of the the, the sort of I mean, maybe a coincidence, but this is what has triggered so much interest in um, in WIMP dark matter. Um, now um, there is a lower limit, as I just said, on the um, uh, on what additional dark matter states you can place with such couplings in the universe and not affect Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Um, and so to not sort of throw out the calculations that you get from BBN, that would, in most models, this would suggest that you would have a, a wimp mass of order, at least of order one to 10 MeV, or, uh, and certainly could be larger than that. As I said, there are other models on the market which can, can go below that, but this is sort of a, this is the traditional uh, assumption. So a, the sort of the, the classic example of a, of a WIMP is the lightest supersymmetric particle, uh, which comes from uh, supersymmetry theory, which as I guess, since I'm talking probably primarily to an audience of particle physicists, uh, probably many, most of you or many of you will know what supersymmetry is. But for those of you who don't, um, then of course, this is uh, a theory which was proposed to solve uh, uh, in the context of the standard model, the, uh, the gauge hierarchy problem. So explaining the the observed 
uh, uh, value of the electroweak scale and more recently the, the mass of the Higgs. Um, and in order to do this, we duplicate the standard model uh, particle spectrum with states with the same coupling, but the opposite spin statistics. So fermions uh, for bosons and vice versa. And if the masses are between of the standard model states and the SUSY states are identical, then we can uh, cancel divergent corrections uh, in the, the Higgs mass and thence the electroweak scale um, from loops, um, which incorporate SUSY particles, cancelling out the loops that involve the standard model states. So you see an example in the bottom left here. Now, the, the, the fly in the ointment here is that um, supersymmetry cannot be an exact symmetry of nature because we don't see SUSY particles with the same masses as the standard model particles. So this, this means the masses must be different. Supersymmetry is a broken symmetry. And this means that the cancellations must be, must be partial. And um, the, now that we have uh, observed the, the Higgs, um, this, uh, the, the mass of the Higgs puts strong constraints on the, or puts constraints on the masses of the, uh, of the SUSY partners, uh, in particular the partner of the top, top court, the, the top score or stop. Uh, so the mass scales that we're looking at typically, uh, both from direct searches, which I'll come on to in, in lecture three, and also from these more theoretical arguments, we're looking at scales around a TV or, 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 um, or more. Um, so that's for the, uh, for, for instance, for the, the, the top squawks uh, and some other states. The, the lightest supersymmetric particle could be lighter than that. Um, and um, to make a good dark matter candidate, we need a stable lightest supersymmetric particle. Now, SUSY models can, many of them can um, mediate rapid nucleon decay, which, which obviously is a problem for, for the universe if, if we have uh, uh, short-lived protons and neutrons. Um, and so we propose a new uh, uh, symmetry and parity called R parity, which um, is uh, multiplicatively conserved in SUSY decays, which prevents the decay of um, the lightest supersymmetric particle. So these are our parity conserving models, typically are, are the bulk of the SUSY dark matter models. And these have a, an absolutely stable lightest supersymmetric particle, LSP, and that's then um, a WIMP dark matter candidate. Um, so um, there are a variety of, of, of um, SUSY candidates for, um, for uh, the LSP. Um, the most commonly studied one is the lightest neutralino, which is a mixture of the SUSY partners of the um, neutral standard model uh, electroweak gauge boson. So that's the B and the W3, and also the SUSY Higgs uh, doublet. Um, so these four partner particles, the Bino, the Wino, and the two Higgsinos, mix together to form four neutralinos. And then the lightest of these is often the lightest supersymmetric particle in many models. Uh, the, there are other candidates, so this neutrino is another possibility in extended uh, minimal supersymmetric standard model models. Uh, gravitino in GMSB models and, and also other candidates like the axino, which is the, the SUSY partner of the axion, uh, which I'll come on to in lecture three. So there's a variety of different candidates. Um, I'm really going to be talking primarily just generically about uh, SUSY uh, WIMP candidates here, but often that's understood to be, uh, in many models, to be the uh, lightest neutralino. Um, now, one point I would observe is that um, uh, most of the simple neutralino dark matter models um, in SUSY uh, give you a dark matter density if you if you look at the annihilation cross section and calculate the annihilation processes taking place in the early universe they give a dark matter density which is inconsistent with the constraints that we've just seen so you know roughly 30 percent uh, dark matter uh, if you have a pure bino um, um, lsp neutralino lsp then the annihilation cross section uh, can be too small Whereas if you have a Wino or Higgsino, then the cross sections can be too large. So you need to do something else to modify this, this, uh, this cross section. Uh, and there's various possibilities. Uh, for the Bino, you could enhance the annihilation cross section through a resonance, for instance, with a heavy Susie Higgs. 
you could co-annihilate in the early universe. So it's not in the early universe, in the early plasma, if there are other SUSY states which are close in mass to the, uh, to the LSP, then they could also be produced in the plasma. And so you could get annihilation, not just between LSP dark matter particles, but also between LSP dark matter particles and other SUSY states. So that's called co-annihilation. And that can also enhance the annihilation cross-section. Um, for the Wiener or Higgsino, you can suppress the cross-section by increasing the mass, or you can just mix, have a mixed uh, uh, LSP neutralino state with mixtures of these different particles, and that will also give you the right dark matter density. So there's just something to, to watch out for here. And I, I'm going to be looking at, as we go through the lectures, um, two cases just as benchmarks are the pure Wino and pure Higgsino cases. And as I said here, to get the right dark matter density, you need a, a heavy state um, to get the right annihilation cross-section. And so if you have pure Wino dark matter, then this means that the mass must be of order 3 TeV, roughly. Whereas for pure Higgsino, then um, the mass is nearer 1.1 TeV. So I'm going to, these are not, you know, these are by no means the only possibilities, but these are just a couple of benchmarks, which I'll be touching on later on. So we'll move on to indirect uh, WIMP searches. So this is looking for uh, annihilation or decay products using astrophysical probes, so uh, light or, or um, gamma rays or, or neutrinos or whatever. So again, here we have WIMPs which are trapped in a, in a gravitational potential well, and they annihilate to standard model states. Uh, and then these standard model states typically then uh, decay uh, to give the messengers, the long-lived messengers, which we can observe uh, on with our terrestrial telescopes and detectors. Because we're not relying on, um, uh, on production, like in a collider, for instance, uh, we are sensitive here to heavier WIMPs than, than in um, production experiments. Um, on the other hand, the energy spectrum of the messengers is only loosely correlated with the dark matter mass. So if you look at this figure here, you can see that for here plotted on the x-axis is basically the fraction of the energy of the messenger uh, divided by the mass of the dark matter particle. And you can see that you get very broad distributions. So there's only a loose correlation between the energy spectrum of the, um, uh, of the messengers and the mass of the, of the dark matter particle. Um, something I'm not going to touch on today, but I will touch on in lecture three, is, is decaying dark matter. Uh, and here, the, the correlation is, of course, much closer, um, since you can... Um, have a, uh, a monoenergetic line from a, from a two-body decay. Um, so I thought this was quite a nice slide from Chris, uh, Christoph uh, Weniger um, in 2018. Was, was you know well, why are we bothering with indirect searches? Um, so um, it, 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 there's a number of arguments here. We we could have no choice. It could be that we have very heavy dark matter, or it could be that we're just unable to detect it uh, with other uh, other methods. Uh, one argument which is often made about indirect searches is that if you do see a signal, can you really establish that you're seeing new physics and not uh, some, some complicated astrophysics? And we'll touch on that in a minute. Um, but I think it's fair to say that there are so many op opportunities for uh, testing your observations with other targets, you know, other galaxies or, or other types of astrophysical object that although you may not be able to establish things at the at the level of, of uh, confidence that you might have from a, a well-controlled terrestrial experiment. Nevertheless, there's a lot that you can do to establish uh, um, uh, a clean signal. Um, so yeah, so th this really offers the advantage of um, probing very large mass ranges um, uh, using a broad range of messengers and energy from radio waves right the way up to ultra high energy cosmic rays. So there's a huge possibility there. And of course, many of the instruments that we use for these experiments already exist because they've been built for more conventional astrophysics, uh, particularly in the form of uh, optical telescopes. So gamma ray uh, signals, um, they are a major target of um, uh, a broad range of, of um, 
experiments both on the ground and also in space. So the, the, some of the key players on the ground are the HESS telescope, um, which is um, um, uh, atmospheric uh, uh, Cherenkov telescope. Um, we have uh, HAWK um, in Mexico, which is using um, Cherenkov effects in, in water. Uh, we have MAGIC, which is a bit like HESS and, and VERITAS. Um, in space, we have the Fermi uh, telescope, um, which uh, is also uh, has a much smaller area coverage, um, but is a much higher precision instrument than, than the, the ground-based uh, experiments. So these experiments typically produce limits on this velocity averaged annihilation rate, which can then be directly related to the, um, uh, to the uh, annihilation rate in the early universe. Uh, which um, uh, is correlated with the, the dark matter density. So this is, this is a very powerful technique and um, uh, the, uh, the dwarf spheroidal galaxies, which, which I mentioned earlier on, are a, are a prime target for some of these searches. So we, if you look at the figures on the bottom right, we can make some assumptions about what is being directly produced in the annihilation of the dark matter particles. For instance, in the left-hand figure, it's the the WW. Um, unfortunately, my um, my screen had, cut, had the, the right hand side of my screen is covered up with some zoom um, windows, so I, I can't actually see the, my, the far right hand side of my slides. But um, but you can see that basically under different assumptions about the annihilation uh, products, direct annihilation products, you can then interpret that in terms of the gamma rays that are uh, that you're uh, observing or searching for, and use that to set limits in the absence of a, of a signal on uh, the annihilation rate um, as a function of the dark matter uh, particle mass. And you can see the, the masses we're looking at here are really very, very high in collider uh, terms. These are up in mul multiple uh, TVs or tens of TV. Um, now, there is uh, some, uh, an interesting observation here uh, from data from Fermi uh, is that, um, um, actually, I've got the dates wrong in that first bullet, apologies for that. Um, so there's a, uh, a claim from um, uh, Goodenough and Hooper uh, that there was uh, an excess uh, um, of uh, gamma rays from the galactic center, which was then confirmed using Fermi data, uh, which was then confirmed by, um, by, by the Fermi collaboration in 2015. So this, if you look on the le bottom left figure, you'll see there's a, basically a broad excess around six and a half GeV uh, when observing towards the center of the Milky Way. And this might be consistent with um, the decay of a 10 to 40 uh, GeV WIMP dark matter candidate, which is what you see in the, uh, the middle uh, figure. Um, as is often the case, and as was alluded to earlier on though, uh, given that this is uh, a very astrophysically complicated region at the centre of the galaxy, there's a, as we know, you know, we know that there are um, um, uh, there's a large black hole in the centre of the galaxy. There's all sorts of very um, um, complicated astrophysics going on. That this may be due to something else. So an alternative hypothesis is that there could be um, uh, an unresolved population of millisecond pulsars in the centre of the galaxy, which is generating these high energy uh, gamma rays. So this, this is an act, active topic of, of investigation. And, and so there's lots of studies going on into this. Um, now I'll just touch on um, this, one of these two benchmarks I mentioned, we know dark matter, pure we know SUSY dark matter. And here we get very strong constraints as is noted in this, this paper here, coming from um, gamma ray observations. Um, it depends a bit on what you assume for the shape of the halo. So I've mentioned the Navarro, Frank White and the Inastro um, halo uh, models, uh, so which give you the density distribution in the, in the, in the galaxy. Um, but if you, um, uh, if you make some assumptions about that halo, then um, you can see that um, the limits which are coming from Fermi and also from Hess are, put, are really testing the, uh, uh, the we know dark matter hypothesis very strongly. So if you have a pure we know uh, dark matter candidate, a mass of around 3 TeV or just a bit below, which is the orange dashed line, um, 
then uh, from the models that you're that you have and these there's uncertainties of course in these models uh, then that's sort of suggesting that these are under very strong uh, tension or, or are under some tension at least with uh, observations for instance from Hess. So this is an example of indirect searches putting some constraints on dark matter candidates. Right, um, uh, sorry, this is yeah. maybe just to say 10 minutes. And... Sure, yeah, yeah. So um, another possible signal uh, comes from antimatter production. There's, uh, this is a, a good probe of um, dark matter production in the universe because um, there aren't so many sources of, of antimatter in the, in the wider universe. So you can look at, um, for instance, the ratios of, um, uh, for instance, positrons to electrons, or looking at the uh, rate of uh, antiprotons to protons. And these then probe anomalous sources of antimatter production in the universe. And of course, if you have an annihilation of a dark matter particle uh, taking place commonly, then this will be producing uh, both matter and uh, antimatter um, in equal amounts. So this is would be adding to your uh, amount of, uh, relatively speaking, your amount of, of antimatter. So there's been, uh, this is a very active uh, topic of study. Um, and there has been some excesses uh, observed, uh, both with positrons. So the positron excesses in Pamela, uh, Fermi and, and AMS, um, which could be consistent with an additional astrophysical source or could be consistent with a dark matter particle with a mass of order 1.2 TV, for instance, as you see in the, the, um, the bottom left and center figures. Um, so there's, the, the, that's, uh, there are both uh, more conventional explanations and also possible dark matter explanations there. Uh, and then more recently, there's also an antiproton excess in AMS, um, which you can see in the bottom right hand figure. Um, and there are both fits with and without dark matter uh, are in agreement with the, the data there. So probably the modeling uncertainties need to improve to, to make a, a conclusive uh, statement on that. Um, to now just turn briefly to the, one of the other uh, benchmarks, which I mentioned, which is Higgsino, a pure Higgsino dark matter. Here, the situation is a bit different from the, the Winos, uh, from Wino dark matter. Um, the constraints that you can get from gamma rays are much less strict um, and in fact it's it's antimatter uh, observations which provide some of the strongest uh, strongest uh, constraints there are also possibilities for constraints from uh, astrophysics from the um, heating of, of white dwarfs from from annihilation of xenos um, but um, in terms of uh, indirect searches if you look at the um, uh, figures here, you can see that uh, on the left, the constraints that you get from, um, uh, from gamma rays, um, either assuming that the dark matter particles annihilate to WW or to ZZ, um, there the Higgsino uh, curve, which is the orange curve, is um, really much, much lower than the, uh, than, than the uh, limits that you get from Fermi or from Hess, for instance, in red or green. And so if you have a 1.1 TV Higgsino, then this is well outside the constraints. If you look at antiproton anti signals from AMS, then these are getting much closer to, um, to the theoretical predictions for Higgsino dark matter. So that, that, although we're not there at excluding those candidates yet, um, that's, that's definitely getting, getting closer. Uh, and then just to touch on other uh, messengers, um, uh, neutrinos, of course, are also a very good um, uh, messenger candidate. They pass through uh, vast amounts of baryonic uh, matter, which might be uh, in the space in, uh, between um, the source and, and uh, de terrestrial detectors. Um, we get very strong limits from the galactic center from both neutrino telescopes at, at high energy, so high mass particles, so for instance, from Ice Cube or Antares. Uh, and then also uh, we can um, repurpose long baseline detectors like um, super Kamiokande uh, to get uh, lower th limits on lower threshold and lower mass particles. Uh, the limits that you see here, again, these are presented in, in terms of the uh, thermally averaged uh, annihilation uh, rate as a function of the dark matter particle mass. These are 
then competitive also with uh, limits coming from direct searches for the uh, spin dependent WIMP proton coupling. Um, so um, uh, stars contain a lot of hydrogen. Um, so we have uh, WIMP, potentially WIMP proton interactions taking place um, uh, inside um, uh, astrophysical objects. And um, so these, when I come on to direct searches later on in the next lecture, you'll see that um, we can actually compare uh, the, the indirect limits coming from, from neutrino searches with uh, spin dependent uh, um, uh, limits from direct searches. So in the future, of course, this is, there's a really many opportunities for improved sensitivity for indirect searches. We have major new multi-messenger astrophysics facilities and particle physics facilities are uh, being built. So in neutrinos, for instance, of course, we have Dune and Hyper-K. In gamma rays, we have CTA. So really, the, it, there's an explosion in sensitivity uh, to these messenger searches uh, for dark matter. And in particular, CTA will strongly constrain uh, both we know dark matter models uh, with its sensitivity on the, uh, on the um, left and, um, and also give us sensitivity to Higgs, approach sensitivity to Higgs Zeno models. So um, there's a lot of, I think, a lot of excitement in terms of future prospects for indirect searches with all these major new facilities coming online in the near future. Okay, and I will stop there. Great, thanks a lot, Dan. This was a super nice and interesting lecture. So I think we have time for some questions. If people have questions, uh, can you raise your hand in Zoom? Or you can, so I see uh, Savannah has a question. Please go ahead. Hi, and thanks for the talk. Um, in your earlier slides, you were mes mes sorry, mentioning how uh, dark matter, cold dark matter goes from small to large and the other vice versa. Can you elaborate on what you meant by that? Um, yeah, so this is, I guess if you think about this, well, let me just find the, find the slide. Um, so this is something which I guess can be understood sort of broadly speaking, but which is supported by the um, numerical simulations of, um, um, of structure formation, which really, again, is a, is a whole, a, a massive field in itself um, with using powerful supercomputers, et cetera. And I guess what you sort of see is that um, if you have hot dark matter, then, um, as that's relativistic at, at decoupling, that, that means it's basically, it it's, it's has enough energy to um, escape from potential wells. So it washes out small scale structure. And so you form structure on the largest scales where, where these um, light particles, so high energy particles, um, are trapped on very large distance scales. And then gradually you have cooling and you start to be able to trap on smaller scales. By contrast with cold dark matter, because this is already low energy, um, then that can start to clump on very small scales. And then it's the, if you like, it's the clumping of the clumps, which then forms the, the, the larger scale structure. So it's, it's a sort of, obviously, a, there's a transition between the two. And, um, and so it's, these, are, these are sort of two extreme cases. But, um, but it, it, as you can see, it sort of gives rise to the, energ the energetics, the kinematics of the particles related to their mass then gives rise to qualitatively different uh, uh, structure formation mechanisms in the other universe. Thanks. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, is there other questions for Dan? If not, maybe I can just, uh, it's more, maybe more a comment, but um, so you said that the dark matter can't be strongly interacting. But there are um, nowadays um, some ideas that it can be um, not strongly like uh, composite, uh, let's say baryons or these, what are they, sex duplets or something. Do you, is, is these, maybe you'll discuss this later, but is this something that um, we should take seriously? So like QCD objects, which are color neutral, but um, can be yeah, made out of standard model particles effect. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, okay, I, I, I was simplifying things as I, as I have been all the way through, but yes, of, of course. I mean, yes, there are ways of evading those heavy element searches um, uh, 
but effectively you can have strongly interacting uh, dark matter candidates provided they don't then bind and into into atomic nuclei to to then leave something which we can uh, observe um, uh, directly but as long as you evade that constraint then obviously there's there's more possibilities so of course yes those, those are models i won't actually be talking much about them later on but um yes that's a possibility sure no, no problem i see there's another question from uh, sijin is it okay uh, thank you for the lecture uh, but unfortunately I, I have some problem with the computer i came here late would you plan to uh, post your uh slide on the in the call then we can i can Yes, I, I'm sure Jamie will tell me how I can do that. So, yeah, yeah, the slides will, and also a uh, video will be on Indico, so uh, this should be fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, if there's no more questions, then uh, we have the next lecture tomorrow at the same time. Uh, so please attend, and thanks again to Dan for this very nice lecture. So see you all tomorrow.